Hello everyone, we're getting ready to look up today with a brand new Uplook video with a vital top 10 list. You can like the video, subscribe, and ring the bell to make sure you don't miss out on any of our future videos. Today's topic explores 10 important life roles we should teach our children. One biblical illustration used of young people and the influence we have on them is an arrow. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Psalm 127.4 Every arrow, like every life, has a point, but the arrow must be prepared, then aimed, and released. So what is the target you're aiming for? Our children are a precious heritage from the Lord. How should we be preparing them? So, obviously, a personal topic for us. <laughs> Number one, be authentic. A really in a world of phonies. Yes. Of all people, you're the best one suited to be you. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 says, We are his workmanship. The word is poema, a poem, a masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. It's a terrible tragedy when somebody foists on their children their own frustrated dreams. I knew a young woman and her mother always wanted to be a geriatric nurse and never was. And she kept pushing her daughter. Eventually the daughter became a geriatric nurse. But every time one of her patients died, a little bit of her died and she had a tragic end. God designed our children for something, and it's not up to us to decide what they should be. It's up to us to help them to be what God designed them to be. And so we need to delight in each child's unique qualities and play to their strengths and encourage them in their own development to be what God wants them to be. Number two, be an intimate friend and worshiper of the Lord. Of course, we need to do that ourselves. We need to see that our children love the Lord, that it's not something we do on Sunday and then take off like our Sunday suit, that Christ is real to us every day. But um, <clears throat> I'll never forget being at a conference in California and there's a large group of young people and, and I and another speaker were sitting there and the youth leader asked us, what do you know now that you wish you had known when you were the age of these young people? And the other speaker, a good friend of mine, Jamie, he said, I wish I had known that the Lord Jesus was a real person. And you know, that hit me between the eyes because growing up in a home of every privilege where I saw reality in my parents, no question about it, and yet I had come to think of the Lord in terms of being a doctrine, uh, an apologetic argument, a historical figure, but not my best friend. And that's what we want to see. We want to see that intimacy developed with our children. The tendency is for them to have a secondhand Christianity where if they've got a Bible question, we'll tell them the answer. If they have a problem, we'll do the praying. We need to get alongside them and say, well, let's find the answer together so that instead of, well, this is what my dad believes, this is what the Lord showed me, and it becomes more personal. We don't want hand-me-down Christianity. Then number three, to be a servant of God to people. It's a hard thing when you become a servant of people. We, we are not to take our orders from people, but we are to serve people. We serve people, but we're the servants of the Lord. And learning to be a servant in a world that is moving in exactly the opposite direction. Everybody wants to climb to the top, and the servant wants to humble himself and go down to the bottom. And so this is contrary to the way the world thinks. And people will say, well, you'll be used. Yeah, well, the Lord Jesus was used. The world says the worst thing they can think is, I've been used. Christian says, I want to be used. That's the servant heart. And so we need to learn the happiness of being a servant of the Lord. I remember the day that I was talking to you on the phone. I was away preaching, 
and you said to me, Dad, I'm learning to sweat for the Lord. There was a brother who had taken some of you young fellows to help move a lady who I think had pretty much saved everything since Noah's flood, <laughs> and you were hauling up and down the stairs all of these goods, and that was your response. Don't be a quitter. Don't be a complainer. Uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 15, I will very gladly spend and be spent, said Paul. It should be our delight. When my car gets beat up a bit, I mean, I like looking after it, but when it gets some wear and tear on it because I'm using it for the Lord, it's his car. And if he wants me to use it, then three cheers. And to treat my body in the same way, it's his. It's not mine. So let the Lord give us opportunities to show our children how to be servants and to see the joy of service, not just the obligation of it, but the joy of it. Number four, be a serious Bible student. Well, we're told that in this book is the fountain of life. Everything we need to know to live a life pleasing to God is found in this book. And our children don't simply need to be exposed to the Bible. They need to learn to expound, to to understand the Bible and to live it out in their life. And that's far different than simply hearing Bible stories. They need to think in scripture. They need to think God's thoughts. And I think what we want to see is that they be quick to obey. It's a bad habit if we go on Sunday, hear the preaching, come out and get in the car and drive home as if we hadn't even been there. And one of the great things to do when you're riding along in the car what did the preacher say today? What are we going to do about that? And so we apply the truth to our family life on a regular basis, and our children learn that we take the Bible seriously, and that's the happy life. That's the life that wins. Number five, be a consistent witness. Well, we have these children when they're young and their minds are fertile. And if we don't get the good seed of the word in, the devil will get the tares in. And so we need right from the start to give them opportunities, memorizing Bible verses. They can memorize much easier than we can in midlife or older. And so utilize that time, get them memorizing some good Bible verses. And in addition to that, helping them understand what the gospel is at a child's level explain the gospel. This is the great thing about the gospel, that it's designed for children to believe it. And so get them familiar and understanding what the gospel is, and then giving them little opportunities to go along, perhaps as you're handing out gospel tracts, and let them do some. Little children can get away with far more than we can, and some crusty characters will take a tract from a child where they wouldn't take it from an adult. So encourage them again, in the joy of serving the Lord, especially in this way, as a, as a witness, as a soul winner. Number six, be a faithful steward. We teach our children to pray before they're saved. We should teach our children to give before they're in the fellowship of the local church. We say, what's the point of giving the child a little bit of money and letting them put the money into the collection? Well. A good habit is not a bad thing. And if it becomes a way of life to the child, that's a good thing to do. That on the first day of the week, we've laid in store how God has prospered us. And to look for little opportunities to let the children sacrifice a bit and say, look at, uh, you know, instead of having all these gifts coming, what would you say if you select some of these gifts that you're receiving and it'll be your opportunity to go down and give them to some poor children or to give them to an organization that offers them to poor children. And so we give them little opportunities, take them to a soup kitchen, take them to an old folks home, give them opportunities to use their time and their talents, maybe uh, to make some little presents for some of the old timers, a little bow and a, make a little card. And at the early stages, give them opportunities to develop stewardship Hudson Taylor said, a little thing is a little thing, but faithfulness in a little thing is a great thing. And then number seven, be an encourager. It's the most needed ministry. It's the most effective ministry. It can invest in every life, and it lets me be a part of every gift. 
And so little children can encourage. They're natural encouragers. They love to draw hearts. They love to draw pictures. And so for them to draw a little picture and then get them to put the Bible verse they're learning on that picture and give it to their neighbor, give it to their school friend. You used to do that. And I think it's a great way to realize we're sharing the truth. We're sharing the word of God with people. They're not going to throw it away. The little old lady down the street, she's going to put it on her fridge because you did it for her. And so teaching them at the early age to be encouragers of others is a wonderful thing. Instead of being so me-centered, so self-centered, to learn to turn them out like the bud of a rose flowering and the perfume comes out and teaching them the joy of being other-oriented and not self-oriented the way the world often is and children often are. And then number eight, be hospitable. You know, we've never had bigger homes, better resources, microwaves and freezers, and that it seems we've never treated our homes more like castles with drawbridges, pulling them up and keeping them to ourselves. We're going to give an account for that someday. There are Christians on the other side of the world have little hovels. They use them for the Lord. What are we going to say when we stand before him? One of the best things we can do with our children is have God's people into our homes. To have a hymn sing, to have a time of testimonies, to have missionaries, to hear them tell their stories. And don't push the children off to bed. I mean, they have to have their sleep. But make sure there are opportunities for the children to get in on the hospitality and not think this is an adult thing and we don't want the kids around. Include them in the hospitality so that as they grow up, they discover that the winning combination is open homes, open hearts, open Bibles. Wherever you see God working in the West, you'll always find that combination. Let them learn it at home sweet home. Then number nine, be generous and thoughtful givers. This is kind of like the idea of stewardship, although stewardship includes our gifts, our talents, our bodies, our time, and a lot of other things. But the idea of being a generous giver and being a thoughtful giver, the scripture says that love needs to flow between the banks of wisdom and discernment. Some people just sort of knee-jerk respond if they get a letter in need or some need. We need to teach our children to be thoughtful, to look at the missionary magazines and to pray for those missionaries and maybe to send a little money over to the children of these missionaries from our children and make that little connection. And when they get a letter back with a foreign stamp on it from a child on the other side of the world, it's a huge encouragement that they have invested in the work of God. So we know the secret of enrichment is giving away. We want our kids to be rich, not in this world's goods, because it all just burns up in the end. We want them to be rich in the true riches, and we want, again, to model it, and we want to teach them how to be good givers, how to be methodical in their giving, to be spontaneous in their giving, to be happy givers, to be, as the Bible says, hilarious givers. Yeah. And then finally, number 10, be a happy warrior. Yes, I think this is important. You know, it's a battle. It's a war. There are problems. There are challenges. We have an enemy. But the joy of the Lord is our strength. And uh, I loved the story where Israel goes into battle singing the victory song. And there's something appealing to that, to my spirit. And I think if our children realize this, yeah, there are tough times. But God is good. And there are difficulties we face. But we're going to smile at the storm. We're going to go into the battle and say, this is good for us. God is with us. He's leading us in triumph. And we're going to stay on the sunny side of the street. Keep yourselves in the love of God. My old dog, Major, when I was a boy, when the winter sun came in at a slant into our living room, he'd plop down in the sun. And as the sun moved its course and that little ray of light moved, he'd get up and move over and plop down again. And after a bit, he'd realize he was in the shade, getting a bit chilly. He'd open one eye and see that the sun 
had moved and up again and over and he chased that beam all the way across the room. And I thought to myself, there are lots of dark things and discouraging things and problems. We don't want to be crepe hangers. We don't want to be negative. We have every reason to be positive. We're more than conquerors. He makes everything work together for good. Let's give our kids a positive attitude, not a Disney World mentality uh, where it's always princesses and parties. It's a war. It's a battle. But we're happy warriors and we celebrate our victories. We enjoy the free pleasures that are available everywhere. A walk in the park, the art gallery. There are lots of things we can do. We don't have to spend $10,000 to be happy. There are lots of things we can do. Savor the moments, celebrate our children, celebrate the blessings of life and be a happy warrior.